What if I told you that computer programming actually has a lot in common with magic? Consider this. Software programs are written in code, which, like a sorcerer's spell, is rife with strange words and arcane symbols. And indeed, this sorcerer's spell we also call the source code. By casting the magical incantation, that is, by executing, running the program, we conjure the spirit of the computer with our spells. A program in execution is called a process, and a process is a slave to the programmer's code. But in this video, we will show ways of how to bend the will of a summoned process to make it do our bidding. Okay, enough of the fancy talk. Basically, I wanted to hack processes. And this video will showcase highlights of programming the tools needed to make it happen. That is, what obstacles to be aware of and how I overcame them. But first of why? Why would we want to hack a process? Well, imagine we run a program, like a game, and we're having a hard time making money, gaining levels, or finding secrets. Once running, the game only allows us to interact with it as the programmers intended, through the joystick, through the keyboard. But what if we wanted to cheat, just stay, just stop taking damage and give me infinite money, etc., you name it. That is an example of warping the will of the summon process. Also, we will be wearing Linux glasses along the way. Think of any game with a save file. The save file is like a crude snapshot of your progress. If you have, say, 500 gold pieces and you save your game and load it up, you want to continue the game where you still have your 500 gold pieces. We could thus alter the save file with a text editor and make it save like 5 million gold instead. And indeed, this is quite possible with simpler save files, though there are some problems involved, like the save file is not easy to access, it is somewhere hidden on a machine, the values are stored in a weird indirect fashion, and we might get back to this later, or there is no standard save file format to begin with, so you always have a search effort with trial and error involved. But the real big issue with save file hacking is that the changes you can introduce with save file hacking are very limited in scope of what they actually can do. Just think of the things you can do in a game and what needs to be saved in a save file to resume the game. Say all the material possessions of the hero and his status might be indeed part of the save file, but things like the rules of the game, of how much damage a certain class makes, how high you can jump or whatever rules the game commands, are not part of the save file. Not to mention that the altered save file only serves from the moment it is loaded, it is sometimes not accessible everywhere, like a quick save or a quick load feature. Just think of chess, where you can resume the game if you know the position of every pieces and, well, who last took their turn. But you can't change the rules of the game, like taking two turns in a row, or having no peasant, or having the peasant move like the queen. You get the idea. The bottom line is, if we want to get hold of any runtime data, we need to try to wield the spirit of the computer, the process. So we want to do some process hacking. So first, let's write a program that summons a very simple process. In this case, we will um, just enter an endless loop and stay within it. And there's nothing stopping us from, do, from leaving it. And basically, we will have this flag, which is on initiation already the hexadecimal ABCD and will match against itself, so to speak. So we will stay within this while loop and never to leave it. So, uh, so this uh, process is set up in such a way that we will try to change ABCD so that we will leave this loop when we were successfully hacking the process and we get some feedback um, terminating the function and telling us to what value did flag change upon leaving the while loop. So let's set things up for the process hacking. So we uh, summon this while loop Nothing happens, we're staying within this while loop. And the second thing which I come to is we want to monitor this uh, process. So you fetch uh, the process ID using pidoff, which takes the process name and returns the, the process ID. And we see spam is being called here. It uses 100% of the CPU resources. We have eight CPUs. So 100% means it's a single threaded process. And here's the process ID. And that will be useful in a moment. But anyway, so we have this endless loop running here. 
So how do we manipulate? How do we hack the process memory, right? H how do I get at the safe file, so to speak? Well, how do we do this indeed? Let's ask Google Sensei. Ptrace, which is short for Process Trace, is a Linux system call, or syscall for short. As such, it is the process interface to the Linux kernel. A syscall is needed because changing the data of another process is a privileged action, only to be carried out by the kernel. In practice, it is just a for-argument function. So in order to do some process hacking, we need to use Ptrace. Now ptrace is, is uh, being included here with sys slash ptrace.h, which is part of the libc standard c library. It is a system call, like I already said, uh, which means that it is the, a way of the process to communicate uh, with the outside world. It needs to use um, software interrupts, which is a system call. And it has uh, four arguments. The first one is an enum for request. And the second one, we want to do something, which is what the request indicated, with a particular process, and we refer to it by its uh, PID process ID. So in this case, we would want to um, communicate with spam, so we will use this process ID 15608. And this next second two um, arguments uh, depend on the request we use. The first one is the address, so the address of the process memory and data if we want to put some data in there or fetch some data from the, the process we are um, controlling. So already written some function attached to, which will, that's the basic uh, mechanism uh, we will use ptrace, is we will attach to a process, stopping it, manipulating its uh, data, and detaching from it at the end, and then concluding the execution, the, uh, continuing the execution of the process. So let's uh, start here. So let's uh, start here. We execute this attached to, and then the process ID, so 15, 15, 608, and this won't work. It's all zeroed out. Uh, it can't really read the contents of the process. And that's because, like I said, a system call is a privileged uh, operation. So we need to be root for that. And now it has some contents. So basically what we did here is, uh, if you see, spam now uses 0% of the CPU because indeed it is now, it changed its status from running to traced. And uh, after we execute this ptrace attached to on the process, we send a sick stop to the process, stopping it. It's like, it's been like a movie running endless loops. And then we s like post the process by attaching to it. And now we have the liberty of reading out its register contents and already implemented all kinds of things. We, we can step through the process, that is, execute a single instruction, a sh single machine instruction, and then stopping it on the next. So for example, uh, here we have a the instruction pointer, RIP, R meaning we, we are on a 64-bit machine. So the instruction pointer is 64-bit in size. And we are currently on the instruction 40547, which is hexadecimal. And if we uh, write in S, we single step through the operation, which uh, in effect is, if you look down left here, I will write it down for you quickly. Oh, let's do it in the buffer, which is just a ptrace, a single step, the pit we provided to attach to, and null, null. This is how you do a single step. So let's do this. So if you uh, pay attention to the, the instruction pointer, it will increase slightly, which is hexadecimal, remember. We can continue doing this. And remember, spam is actually in an endless loop. So we should be looping here eventually with these, these instruction pointers here. So let's see, 553, 3E, 44. Now we're back at 44. Let's do this again for sanity test. And indeed we're looping here. So like some five instructions are happening in our is this in our endless loop. Uh, 
So now let's try to read out the particular machine instruction where we're pointing it uh, currently. So let's do a peak data. It wants a hexadecimal value, like 400.544. And here we have it. Here's our peak data. So the, how does this one look like? So this one is a P trace, peak data. I might be wrong on these enums. I don't know them by heart. They're, they're very similar to this. So let's see if I have it here. Ah, right. You always put some P trace, peak data to them. You can read out all the enums using man P trace. And if you scroll down a little bit, you get all these enums. So peak user, peak text, peak uh, set registers. We can even uh, set these individual registers however we want to. Anywho, we will on concentrate because this can be very involved on the process memory itself, not on changing the registers. But this is a domain of ptrace, by the way. You can change process memory with other mechanism, uh, but ptrace is uh, mainly used to read out the registers or is exclusively used for, for this. And we see we have, this is the process um, memory at this particular instruction pointer. So let's uh, find an interesting process memory. This is, for example, an interesting instruction. So we, at the current instruction, we read out the process memory and we get this uh, long number here, which is 64-bit. And it depends on the architecture you'll be using. I currently have a CPU that, uh, that has 64-bit uh, registers. And you can see something interesting in this particular uh, randomly seeming uh, instruction. That is, we have this ABCD value here. And this uh, might indeed be the comparison operation up here. So it actually makes sense that uh, the, the instruction uh, appears in immediate mode right here because ABCD is a literal in this particular uh, comparison. So we could imagine this, this 3D might be our comparison operation or that ABCD is currently being put into, oh, there it is, uh, RAX is a, by the way, the general purpose register where we usually put some arguments that we will apply some machine operations on. So what we could do now here is change this ABCD. So let's do this by using poke data, which is something like this, poke data, our current PID. And the next value is the hexadecimal we are applying this on, 400. 100553. So I'm just showing you what's, what's happening in the background here of, of this convenience layer that I've uh, programmed. And then we're going to put some data in here. So the little um, bad thing about ptrace of its uh, primitive form is that it always either reads out 64-bit words or, or it writes 64-bit words. So if we just want to change this ABCD value here, we need to make sure that everything else stays the same. D -A -D -A -D -D. And now it worked. So now uh, we have this feedback here. It changed to this value. So now if we get single snapping. So if we abort this attaching here, if I type in quit, I will detach from this process, continue its execution, and it will find that this instruction where it does a comparison on will not compare a flag to ABCD, but on DADA -D -A instead. So if we pay attention to what is happening here, go. And we are indeed left the endless loop because the flag has the value 43981. So let's uh, quickly ask Lisp what this value is. So this is the hexadecimal syntax for Lisp. If we ask what ABCD is, it is 43981. So the flag, so something strange happened here, right? So the flag still is ABCD, as we can see here. Still is ABCD, but we still left the endless loop. So what happened here? So remember, what we did change is we changed this immediate, we changed this immediate value of ABCD to DADA. And the immediate value is this thing here. This is what we changed. This we changed to DADA. So flag stayed indeed unchanged. Flag stayed ABCD. And that's why we left the loop. And that's why it uh, tells us, hey, it's still ABCD, but uh, well, the thing that we compared it against, that's what we changed in the process memory. And so that's how it can also go. 
So what's next? We will show how to integrate ptrace into Lisp. We saw that I've written an interactive interface over ptrace so that we can decide at each step if we want to peek, poke or single step the process. This interactive, explorative approach lends itself greatly to the way Lisp's image-based programming at the REPL, the listener, works. I will hence go through the motion of how to write a foreign function interface, also called bindings, to the libc library, so that we can use the ptrace syscall from Lisp, which is surprisingly a lot easier than it sounds. We will then test the program on some actual games and learn a thing or two about Linux processes that will be essential for hacking them. The project will culminate in some poor man's cheat engine capabilities, which we will test on emulators and finally on a commercial game like Rogue Legacy. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.